a lot of people are intimidated when, about this conversation when it comes to race in our schools and our districts. Like, what does that even look like? And because they want to be politically correct. And to be honest, doing the work that I do, I see that happen all the time. But I always say to leaders, like relationships will always supersede being politically correct. Hi, hey everybody, and welcome back to Leading Through Unprecedented Times. And I have to tell you, I am so excited for this episode. I have no doubt it's going to blow you away with my good friend, Chris Singleton. Chris, welcome to the show. How you doing, my friend? I'm doing well, man. Thank you so much for having me on. So you are a former ball player. You get to work with schools around the country and some of those pieces that we will dive into. But Chris, your story is a story that every time I hear you share it, anytime I read anything about it, it stops me in our tracks. You know, those listening today, um, whether it's on Spotify or iTunes or on YouTube, are pretty much school and district leaders around the country that have been facing adversity. Here we are a year into the pandemic, school closures, do they open, do they not? They're facing these challenging situations. Yet when I hear somebody like you who going back these number of years and the story that I'm going to ask you to share a bit about in facing adversity, it's people like you that can help people like principals, like superintendents continue to go that extra mile, continue to run through the walls of adversity for their students. So can I ask you to talk a little bit about your personal story and what it's like to truly face adversity in life? Yeah, for sure, man. So with me, you mentioned, uh, former pro athlete, but my story has really nothing to do about athletics. Um, so I call it the unthinkable, right? I was 18 years young when the worst of the worst happened to me. Uh, a man that wanted to start a race war in this country actually walked into my church on June 17, 2015, and he, he took nine lives. And uh, one of those lives was my mom, Sharonda Ann Coleman Singleton. And so that, that was literally the worst of the worst. Um, when we talk about Adversity, we talk about things you never think would happen to you until it does. That was that night. Um, and coming from that, you know, that's where my mission has been sparked. So just love people and teach that regardless of where somebody's from or what they look like. Um, just spread love and unity. And that's what I've been doing over the last five years after, after my mom was taken away. Yeah, Chris. So your message on love is stronger than hate is so powerful, whether you're in corporate of America or where you're teaching in a school or leading a district, no matter what your role might be, talk to us about that message, what it means to you. And when you get to share with, with school leaders, you get to share a lot with students, what that message on love is stronger than hate looks like. Yeah, for me, I think, man, if, if there just would have been one teacher or one best friend of a student, that was my mother's killer to say, hey, it doesn't matter that Chris may look different than you on the outside. Chris didn't choose that, right? Nobody chooses their first language. Nobody chooses where they're born or who they're, who they're born to. And so when I go to these different organizations, these different schools, I just share that message. And I want teachers to really understand so many people have unfortunately been taught the wrong thing. They aren't ta taught to love one another like you and I are probably teaching our kids or the way we've been taught. And so I, I really think teachers have uh, they're the front line workers when it comes to, you know, promoting unity and, and teaching love instead of hate. So um, I tip my hat to them because I know they're going through it right now, especially. But man, when I think about what it looks like to come together, I think teachers have a vital role in that. Yeah, they absolutely do. And, you know, you do a lot of work around around race and you've mentioned unity. And let's face it, over the past year, it hasn't just been the pandemic that's been in the news. There's been a lot of things around white supremacy and race. And I'm sure those wounds never heal for you. And it continues to bring up, you know, related to part of your story. Talk to us about, you know, what advice do you have for school and district leaders as they try to unify their student body or, or their staff, especially at a time where there is such term, turmoil around race and those things. What message do you have? Yeah, I think uh, a lot of people are intimidated when, about this conversation when it comes to race in our schools and our districts. Like, what does that even look like? And because they want to be politically correct. And to be honest, doing the work that I do, I see that happen all the time. But I always say to leaders, like, relationships will always supersede being politically correct. So, so we're so nervous of saying the wrong thing. But if the person on the other side knows your character, knows who you are personally, you may say the wrong thing and they won't, they won't get offended by it. 
they'll maybe teach you in that moment, but they won't get offended and cancel you. You know why? Because they have a relationship with you. And I think so many people are scared to say the wrong things uh, because maybe they, they people don't know their heart as much as they should um, moving forward. So with all the teachers that I'm that I, I share with and the principals and I want th- I want their uh, students and their staff to know, man, at the end of the day, they need to know who you are as a person and how much you care, because we all slip up. We all do. Right. We say the wrong thing on accident. But if people know you and your character and your heart, they know that you genuinely would never mean to, to harm somebody with your words. Man, that's where you don't see the cancel culture come into play. And you see people really just teach in those moments. Um, and, and I love that because that's how we move forward. We don't move forward by, you know, ridiculing somebody about this or about that. It's all about teaching them in those moments. And I've seen that over the last couple of years in our schools. Yeah, absolutely. Your message on unity is just so powerful. It's so needed. And schools and districts around the country that I get to work with, we get to work with through Future Ready Schools, really are trying to do the right thing here, move it forward, have these conversations. You know, Chris, a good friend of mine, I used to say difficult conversations. And a good friend, one of my best friends in the world, a guy named Ken Shelton, who's a black male, said, Tom, let me push you on that. He said, you know, when, when we say, when somebody like you says difficult conversations, it can also be taken as like, we don't have time or it's too challenging of a conversation for us to tackle. What if you flipped your verbiage to say the word needed conversations around it? And so it's work with people like you that are continuing to really push the envelope of what needs to be heard. Let me ask you from a real practical end as an educator, let's say I'm a teacher in a classroom as a white male and I have a very diverse set of students and maybe I'm feeling, maybe it's my first year teaching and this is kind of a new thing for me. And I'm aware of all the things that have been happening in the news. And I'm aware of, you know, um, things that have been happening around race and turmoil and and I'm a bit anxious to do the wrong thing, to say the wrong thing, to reach out to a parent. Give me some advice as maybe an early educator um, on where to even start. You just mentioned the relationship piece, but give me some also some other practical advice related to where would I start in the classroom to really make sure my heart and doing the, and I'm doing the right thing. Yeah. And, and to be honest, you don't know what you don't know. So when you talk about people that are just becoming educators, I think the, all the implicit bias training is huge because you don't know what you don't know. When you think about a kid in a certain way, subconsciously, um, you may be acting a certain way towards somebody with a, a last name that that sounds like you, you can't pronounce it. I'll give you I'll give you an example. Uh, recently, this happened at a school where a teacher kept calling this kid uh, something B. Like they didn't say his, they didn't say the kid's name because he just felt weird and couldn't pronounce it. Instead of going to the kid and really sitting down there and, and asking him, OK, how do I really break this down and say it? Because I want to say it the correct way and not offend you. He just kept calling him by the wrong name. And so I think it's little things like that. As a, as a person of color, I would say, man, he, at least he's trying. He wants to know uh, how to say my name and he wants to learn more about me and my culture or maybe where I'm from if I'm from a different country. So there's little things that, about ways people can practically make sure they're uh, united in their classrooms. Uh, and I think that's one of them that they go, that they all can do. Yeah, absolutely. Now you do a lot of work around diversity, around inclusion, you know, working with schools, working with students, getting in front of student bodies, working with higher ed as well. Talk to us about some advice you have around diversity inclusion. The Alliance for Excellent Education, our home organization, we're an equity focused organization and certainly work a lot around these areas with school and district leaders. So let's say you have a room full of superintendents right now and you get to talk about diversity and inclusion. What are some of the pieces you talk about? What's some of the advice you give on where they should either begin or continue the work? Well, number one, I heard this one time and I thought it was, was funny. I've worked with a couple companies that are, are I'd say they, they set the standard. I, I, I share with Microsoft and they set the standard of what that should, should be, I believe. And they basically ask everybody else. They have different surveys. They say, what is the diversity commitment from our organization look like to you guys? Right. Because there's some people that, that don't really know. And there's some people that are so passionate to have a voice And they do that with Microsoft. Right. I also have have another organization that I share with and I won't say their name, but they literally said, hey, our our diversity numbers aren't there. So we're giving out zero bonuses until we get those numbers to where they need to be. And people will say to me, Chris, well, I, you know, I feel like I shouldn't just hire somebody based on the color of their skin or this, that and the third. And my, my thought process as a sports minded person, if I need a center fielder, I'm going to go out and recruit a center fielder. But I'm not going to go say, oh, I've got 10 shortstops here. Well, I need a center fielder, so I'm going to go out and get one. Um, so I absolutely love that. And then for me, 
when we talk about diversity and inclusion, diversity sometimes takes time, like like I said, to get the, the, the people that you need in place. But in inclusion, that feeling of feeling like you matter, that feeling of feeling like your voice holds weight, whether you're a superintendent or whether you're a first year teacher, I think that's something that every single organization can do. And they do that by allowing everybody to have that voice. Yeah. For me, I always say, if we share our stories, you can't take that away from me. We need to share our stories before our opinions. And so by me telling you, hey, this is my life, this is my story, and this is my opinion behind that life and story, I think that holds weight than me just saying my opinion and you automatically stop listening. Yeah, some brilliant words there. You know, when we talk about diversity and inclusion, one of the things that we also often will look at is the, you know, the literature kids have op opportunities to see. Can they see mirrors of themselves? And so I want to give you a shout because you are a children's author and you are just in the past week or so come out with your newest book entitled Your Life Matters. And what a just, uh, and you've actually said it already in the podcast related to that, but what an incredible message. So talk to school and district leaders, talk to students that might even be listening really about the premise of your brand new book yeah to be honest you know my first book different was more of a, a broad book for every single student really just including this new kid from nigeria but this book uh specifically teaches black history to all kids but more importantly the kids that look like myself that are saying you know what i've seen everything that happened on tv i've seen the stuff that we may have seen in the news like does my life matter and throughout this book we have different black heroes like uh, President Barack Obama, like uh, Harriet Tubman, like Jackie Robinson saying, yes, you matter. Every part of you matters. Your courage matters, right? Your voice matters. We're just reassuring every little kid uh, that, yes, they mean so much to this world. And that's what this second book, Your Life Matter, does. Oh, absolutely love that. You know, one of the other areas that you do work and as a former uh, baseball player, a pro baseball player yourself, you know, teammates have always been a big thing for you. And our school and district leaders know that they cannot go at this alone, especially as they continue to face adversity, especially with all that's on their plates with the pandemic and all the pieces that we've discussed here as well. What's your advice and how do you talk to the importance of teammates? What's your messaging around that? Go and putting that ball player lens back on, but also when you talk to school and district leaders, what, what do you share there? Yeah, I think I've seen it um, in the education space, especially over the last two years. I think for a while, it was always the person with the most experience can help the person without a lot of experience in a, in a task, right? And I think over the last two years, when we've gone virtual, right? There's some teachers that have been doing it for 30 years, like, man, I got to ask my first year teacher, how do I set this, this Zoom up, right? How do I set this Google Google Meets or Google Hangout up? And so I, I see, I've see i seen that part of it and it makes me laugh. And it also, I just think every single person right now is, is probably going through something that somebody else has gone through. You know, for me, the reason why I was able to get through my mother being killed and not only that, forgiving my mother's killer or doing the work that I do now is because I had a group of people that were around me that were pouring into me every single day. And people would say to me, Chris, how do you not hate white people? It's because white people poured into me after my mother was killed. I knew it wasn't just one. I knew it wasn't everybody that hated me because of the color of my skin. It was one person that was misled and mistaught not to love me. And so I had people from all different walks of life pouring into me. So now I, I say teammates pick us up on the field, of course. But when you have a kid that's goofing off right during a virtual uh, class setting and you're upset, somebody else is going through that, too. And that power of teammates of how people come together and say, you know what, this is what I did to overcome that adversity or overcome that kid dancing when I was giving my lesson. Like, that's powerful. I think everybody needs to tap into that because it's not you're not going through it alone. There's people around you that are waiting for you to ask for help. And I guarantee they'll pour into you just as well. Absolutely. Some powerful words there, my friend. So let me ask you this. Speak about a teacher in your life or an administrator in your life, some educator in your life. Let's give them a shout. Who were they? And what is it that you remember the most? Who's somebody that made a difference for you? You know, I'm going to say something pretty personal here. You know, before pre-pandemic, what I would do is with educators, I'd ask, you know, has anybody ever heard I love you from somebody Somebody doesn't, doesn't look like you, right? Somebody doesn't look like you, doesn't have the same skin color, hair texture. And for me, I, I didn't hear those words until high school from a white person. I know it sounds weird, like we're in year 2021, like we sh that, that's kind of awkward to think about. And I'm a young person myself, but I didn't hear it until high school. I had a guy by the name of uh, Matthew Blake Hall, Coach Hall, who would literally... 
he was our basketball coach. He'd run us up and down the court. He was, I call him crazy, but I love him to death, right? And what he did was he said, you know what? I don't have kids, but you guys are like my kids. And he'd bring us in, he'd hug, we'd, we'd hug them, right? And so now I lost both of my parents at a young age, taking care of my brother and sister. But when I had a question, I went to Coach Hall, right? When I was thinking about buying my first house a couple of years ago after I got drafted, you know who I went to? Coach Hall. Because he poured into us not only as his athletes or as students, but man, he, he was really like family to me and he still is to this day. Wow, some powerful words there and just the impact that an educator or coach and maybe it's not in a classroom, maybe it's on a ball field and and they can truly have. Thanks for sharing that. I appreciate it. So I've got one more question for you. I know you're a busy guy traveling left and right here. And I've got one more question for you. We have so many different listeners of this podcast from superintendents to principals to some teachers as well. We have those that have been leading the way in the pandemic, nationally known. We have those that are just trying to keep their head above water in the midst of such adversity and chaos and taking those one day at a time. Give a piece of advice that you have for educators to continue to move forward. We're starting to see the, the light at the end of the tunnel just a little bit. What advice do you have for educators? Yeah, I, I'd say this, you know, and this is more of a mindset thing for everybody to keep pushing forward. So with me, like I shared, I lost both of my parents pretty early before I was uh, 20 years old. So I took care of my brother and sister in high school and middle school when I wasn't even 21. And the thing that kind of just allowed me to keep pushing forward was you can't control what happens to you in this life, right? I just kept hearing that, but you can always control your response to it. And so I think as educators, if we understand, yes, some days the Wi-Fi is going to mess up, right? Some days the kid's not going to have their, their camera on when they're supposed to, so many things are going to happen, but I just keep thinking, okay, you can't control that, but you can always control your response to it. And I guarantee you people respond with love. They respond with empathy they respond just bringing people together they'll help me in my crazy mission of ending racism that's chris singleton everybody chris thanks so much for joining us today thank you for the opportunity